Hello everyone, I'm Norman Wahlberger and welcome to the Algebraic Calculus. In today's video we're going to demonstrate a lovely new formula for calculating foul hubbard polynomials and Bernoulli numbers. This is something that perhaps foul hubbard and Bernoulli and many other people have somehow missed. Although, as you'll see, it's incredibly elementary and elegant. And along the way, we're going to introduce two very important ideas. The idea of an algebraic derivative and an algebraic integral. So these are, of course, central concepts to calculus, but we're going to be looking at them now from the point of view that Faulhaber originally had and look at it from a very algebraic point of view. All right, so the context is we're looking at these sums of powers as we've been discussing for a while. We're looking at sums of consecutive integers raised to a certain power k. So s sub k of n is the sum from i equals one to n of i to the k. And this is a polynomial in n that depends on k. And Faulhaber exhibited in 1631 these polynomials from S0 all the way up to S17. The first ones are classical. S0 of n is n. S1 of n is 1 half n plus 1 half n squared, more usually written as n times n plus 1 over 2. And we're going to, in this lecture, also introduce capital N to represent this particular polynomial. S2 of n is 1 sixth n plus 1 half n squared plus 1 third n cubed. And then there's a list. And finally, S17 n, that's the last one that Fowl Hubber explicitly wrote down. It is this polynomial of degree 8 teen in n. Starting with the n, n squared, the n to the fourth, n to the sixth, n to the eighth, n to the 10, n to the 12th, n to the 14th, n to the 16, and then n to the 17 and n to the 18. So what we're interested in is a technology for developing these polynomials, which doesn't rely on the linear algebraic framework that we've been using so far. We're going to show you that there's a more elementary, purely algebraic, high school approach to being able to go from one of these polynomials to the next one. It's really quite a remarkable formula. Now often these Paul Halbert polynomials are written in factored form. For example, S1 of n is the one we've already seen, but S2 of n can be written as 1 6 of n times n plus 1 times 2 n plus 1. And then S3 of n, which is a square of this one, is 1 quarter n squared times n plus 1 squared. If we carry on like this, there is a kind of a pattern, but the factorization is actually quite limited. So we do get factors n, n plus 1, and 2n plus 1, but those are really the only ones that are sort of regularly occurring. And uh, otherwise, these other factors end up being just longer and longer. So there's some reason to think that the Faulhaber way of writing them out as just polynomials in uh, n without this factored form is maybe a little bit uh, superior. And that's, of course, also the same uh, orientation that Bernoulli had. So Fallhaber did experiment with alternate ways of writing these polynomials, and he discovered actually something that was quite interesting. Probably motivated by the remarkable occurrence that we've already uh, seen that everybody is sort of surprised by, that the S3, the sum of the cubes of the natural numbers, is exactly the square of the sum of the natural numbers themselves. So if S1 of n, if we write that as capital N, then S3 of n is capital N squared, exactly the square of this one. And that may have motivated Faulhaber to ask, well, what about the other ones, further ones? Can they also be written in terms of capital N instead of little n? And remarkably, he found that they could be, at least for odd indices. So S5 of n can be rewritten in terms of capital N as 4n cubed minus n squared over 3. S7 of little n can be expressed with capital N, so that's 6n to the fourth minus 4n cubed plus n squared over 3. And here's the formula for S9. And he verified that this was the pattern up to the S17. So the natural conjecture here that uh, for every odd k, this Faulhaber polynomial, S sub k of n, is actually a polynomial in capital N. We can rewrite it as formula in capital N. And that has been subsequently uh, proved. So we know that now, but to Faulhaber that would have just been probably a conjecture. 
But what about sums of even powers? Here the situation is more subtle, and Faulhaber discovered something really remarkable. So he discovered that when the power is even, we couldn't quite write it as a polynomial in capital N, but almost. Here's what he discovered, that if we know the sum of an odd power, so sum i equals 1 to n of i, say, to the 2l plus 1, so this is an odd exponent, if we know this as a polynomial in capital N, so looking at the pattern, they all start with capital N squared, so c1 capital N squared, c2 n cubed, all the way up to, say, cl, and to the l plus 1. That's typically how they look like when you have exponent of 2l plus 1 there. In that case, the formula for the previous even power, so the Faulhaber, the sum of the even powers, i to the 2l, can be expressed in the following way. It's another polynomial in capital N, together with a single additional factor of little n plus a half, all over 2l plus 1. And what's interesting is how this polynomial in capital N depends on this polynomial in capital N. And here is the actual relation, so I'm just rewriting it. And it motivates us to introduce this operator. It's actually the first known, as far as I am aware, first known use or appearance of the derivative in a systematic way in mathematics. So here it is, D, capital D of C1n squared plus C2n cubed all the way up to CLn to the L plus 1 is 2C1n plus 3C2n squared all the way up to L plus 1 times CLn to the L. So how are we going from here to here? Well, this is a procedure that is very familiar to anybody who studied uh, calculus. We're taking the derivative in the algebraic sense. So what's happening is we take a term like this and we look at the exponent and the exponent is then brought down. So that 2 comes down as a factor and then the new exponent is just one less. That's happening here too. The 3 comes down as a factor and the 3 is replaced by a 2 all the way up to here. The L plus 1 comes down as a factor and it's replaced with L. So let's emphasize, this was before the development of calculus, before the interpretation of the derivative as the slope of a tangent line having to do with functions and analysis, before Fermat's work, Newton's work, Leibniz's work. Okay? This is a purely algebraic derivative, which is observed by Faulhaber to be involved in going from one formula for the sums of powers to the previous formula for sums of powers. So it's, it's entering here as an algebraic tool that allows him to navigate between successive sums of powers. A purely algebraic setting. So now let's introduce the derivative and the corresponding inverse operator together in a concise algebraic way. So we're talking about the derivative, capital D, and the integral, which we're going to call capital S. And notice that we're using capitals here for both the derivative and the integral, alerting us to the fact that these are very particular kinds of operators which are purely algebraic and actually defined, at least now, only for polynomials. Okay, so they can be defined very concisely using these two formulas that show what their action is on monomials. So let's suppose that throughout here, the polynomials are all polynomials in a variable x. Okay, so we're talking about polynomials in x. Then the derivative d of a monomial x to the k is, as we've seen, k times x to the k minus 1. The exponent comes down as a coefficient, and the new power is 1 less than it was before. And the inverse of that, in some sense, is this operator s, which takes a monomial x to the k and sends it to x to the k plus 1 over k plus 1. So now the exponent is being raised, bumped up by 1, and we correspondingly divide by the new exponent. So, for example, if we have 
this polynomial, 2 minus 3x squared plus 5x cubed, and we're taking the derivative, then what are we going to get? Well, this 2 is really 2 times a power of x. It's 2 times x to the 0. And when we put 0 in here for k, which is an allowed value, then we're going to get 0 times x to the something. So we regard that as 0. It's telling us that the derivative of a constant is 0. So the derivative of 2 will be 0. That's why there's no, nothing over here corresponding to that. The derivative of minus 3x squared, well, we know what the derivative of x squared is. It's 2x, so the derivative of this will be minus 6x. And the derivative of 5x cubed will be, the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared, so this will be 15x squared. Integrating, how does that work? So if we take s of this polynomial, 7 minus x plus 4x to the 7th, say, then integrating this, there's a power of x to the 0 here, we apply this rule, x to the 0, we're going to get x to the 1 over 1. So that 7 becomes 7x when we integrate it. The minus x becomes minus x squared over 2 when we integrate it. The 4x to the 7 becomes 4 times x to the 8 over 8. But 4 over 8 is the same as 1 half, so we get x to the 8 over 2. So the derivative d and the integral s are extended linearly to polynomials. We know what happens to them on monomials, we extend them linearly to polynomials. Notice that there's no limits here. Right? We're not saying anything about a connection with the usual geometry of tangents and slopes of tangents. We're not saying anything about the usual connection with integral as being an area under a curve. We're not making any statement about that. This is purely an algebraic operation on polynomials, which we introduce using these two formulas, following Faulhaber. Okay, so some important fundamental properties of these. First of all, D and S are linear operators. That means that if P and Q are polynomials, and if, say, C is a number, then D of P plus Q will be D of P plus D of Q. And similarly, D of C times P will be C times D of P. And exactly the same thing holds for the integral. S of P plus Q equals S of P plus S of Q, and S of C times P is C times S of P. That's the linear property of these operators. More non-trivial and of crucial importance to the calculus is what we might call the derivative integral composition theorem. What happens when you combine a derivative with an integral? Now it depends on which order you do things. So there's two crucially important formulas. The first one is what happens when you take a polynomial p and you apply d times s. And by that we mean it's the composition of d with s. So we're going to read this as meaning d of s of p. So we start with p and then we apply s, getting s of p, and then we apply d to that. And the statement is that if you do that, if you integrate first and then you differentiate, you're going to get exactly back to where you started. So these are inverse operations when we do them in that order. When we integrate first, which raises the degree, and then we differentiate, which lowers the degree, we end up exactly back to where we started. Correspondingly, if we do it the other way around, if we differentiate first and then integrate, so we apply s times d to p, that's the composition, by that we mean s of d of p. So we take p, we differentiate it first, and then we integrate it. We don't quite get p. We almost get p, but not quite. We get p minus p zero, where p sub zero is the constant term of p. p is a polynomial, powers of x, let's say. So it has a constant term, and then a multiple of x, another multiple of x squared, multiple of x cubed, and so on. So it's that constant term that we're removing, basically taking the polynomial p and stripping away its constant term. That's the effect of doing the derivative first 
and then doing the integral. It just means we're chopping off that constant term and the rest of it is unchanged. Okay, these are easy to verify, um, but they're very important for calculus. In traditional courses, this is closely connected to the fundamental theorem of calculus, but it's important to realize we're not making any statements about you know, the usual geometrical interpretations of these things in terms of areas and slopes of tangents. Nothing like that at this stage. We just have a purely algebraic formulation of these two operations, and this is a purely algebraic routine verification for these two results. And so now we come to the main formula of the talk which is a new understanding of the relationship between Faulhaber polynomials. And it's directly motivated by Faulhaber's thinking when he was looking at the polynomials in capital N, how to go from an odd sum to an even sum, that there was a derivative involved. So it turns out that there's an analogous kind of relation, which is actually simpler and applies directly to the Faulhaber polynomials as polynomials in little n, in other words, sort of the original Faulhaber polynomials. And it's, you know, I don't really know how to say this. I mean, it, this is remarkable to me that this is not well known. It, it should be completely well known and studied by undergraduates everywhere, but I cannot seem to find it anywhere in the literature, so it may very well be new, which is uh, quite astounding. So this is the crucial formula, so let's uh, see what the context is. First of all, I have to remind you about the Pernoulli numbers, okay? So B0 is equal to 1, B1 is equal to a half, we're using that normalization of the Bernoulli numbers, and then B2 is 1 6, and then after that, the odd ones are all 0. So this is the only non-zero odd one. And then B4 is minus a 1 30th, and B6 is 1 42, and there's some pattern, well, not, it's not actually quite hard to predict what they are, but there is some way of proceeding and getting more and more of them. Okay, so here is our derivative of Faulhaber polynomials theorem. It's telling us the relationship between the Faulhaber polynomial of index k plus 1 and the 1 of index k. And the formula is that the derivative of the s sub k plus 1, in this capital D derivative sense, is the constant b sub k plus 1, so the k plus first Bernoulli number, plus k plus 1 times s sub k of n. So for example, here is s sub 7. It's 1 12th n squared minus 7 over 24 n to the 4th plus 7 over 12 n to the 6th plus 1 half n to the 7th plus 1 8th n to the 8th, and Faulhaber was the first person to write that down. Okay, so if we apply this result, it says that the derivative of s of 7, how do we find that? Well, we take the derivative of each one of these things. And this is a derivative now in terms of n because this is a polynomial in n. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, the derivative of n squared is 2n. So this becomes, the 2 comes over there and cancels a little bit, and so we get n over 6. The derivative here, the n to the fourth, you can't get 4n cubed. So the 4 cancels a little bit here, we get 7 over 6n cubed with a minus sign. Over here, we're going to get 6 cancelling with the 12, so we get 7 over 2 times n to the 5th. Here, the 7 comes down, we just get 7 over 2 times n to the 6th, and here the 8 comes down, cancels with that, and we get n to the 7. So that's the derivative, and the theorem says that that's equal to the Bernoulli number b sub 7. Okay, the Bernoulli number b sub 7 is 0 because that's an odd one. Plus 7, k plus 1 is 7 here plus 7 times this thing. So if we, um, we can get this thing by taking this and extracting 7. So we take a 7 out, then we're going to get 1 over 42n minus 1 6 n cubed plus 1 half n to the 5th plus 1 half n to the 6th and 1 7th of n to the 7. And the claim is that this is exactly the b7 plus 7 times s sub 6 of n. So we can go from s sub 7 to s sub 6, essentially just by taking a derivative, stripping away a Bernoulli number, which half the time is zero anyway, and extracting a relevant factor of uh, 7 in this case, corresponding to the index that we start with there.
So there is a very, very direct and elementary and sort of mind-bogglingly simple differential relation between successive Faulhaber polynomials. So the result is very elegant, and the proof, I think, is also very elegant. And it's completely elementary almost, just a little bit of summation and knowing what a derivative is. And, you know, in terms of math education, this is really something that high school students could happily be taught. They learn a lot of things. They learn a little bit about summation notation and uh, a little bit about derivatives, and they make contact with this very beautiful story of these sums of powers polynomials, which have figured prominently in, in mathematics of all kinds, a very important core of the calculus. Okay, so let's prove that theorem that I just told you. And our starting point is going to be the celebrated formula of Jacob Bernoulli, which expresses the kth Faulhaber polynomial, S k of n, as a sum. Well, first of all, 1 over k plus 1, and then the sum j equals 0 to k, the binomial coefficient k plus 1 choose j, times the Bernoulli number b sub j, and then the power n to the k plus 1 minus j. So when j starts at 0, it starts at n to the k plus 1, and then as this goes up, the powers go down by 1. Okay, so our job is to take the derivative, but actually not the derivative of this one, but the derivative of the one with k plus 1. So the derivative of s sub k plus 1. So that means we're going to take the derivative of this, but with k replaced with k plus 1. So this becomes k plus 2. The summation is up to k plus 1. And instead of having k plus 1 here, we have k plus 2. Instead of having k plus 1 here, we have k plus 2. And we're taking the derivative of all of that. And because this is a polynomial in n, and the derivative is linear, we just have to apply the derivative to each one of these powers of n. Okay, so this is what we have to evaluate. So the first thing we might do is decompose what this binomial coefficient is. So k plus 2 choose j is k plus 2 factorial over k plus 2 minus j factorial times j factorial. The two numbers that add up to k plus 2, one of them is j. There's our Bernoulli number. And now what happens when we take the derivative here, the crucial operation? Well, it's simple. The exponent comes down, so there's a k plus 2 minus j, and the new exponent is just 1 less. So it's n to the k plus 1 minus j. And now we see that there's some cancellation. The k plus 2 that's in the denominator here will cancel with the k plus 2 that's on the top of that factorial. Right? This is the product of all the numbers from 1 times 2 times 3 all the way up to k plus 2. So if we cancel a k plus 2, we're going to end up with k plus 1 factorial left over. And similarly down here we have a k plus 2 minus j factorial. And here there's the same term up there in the numerator, so there's also some partial cancellation there. And what's going to be left will be k plus 1 minus j factorial. Otherwise the j factorial stays the same, the Bernoulli numbers stay the same, and this power of n stays the same. Okay, and now we're going to take this sum and we're just going to extract the top term corresponding to j equals k plus 1. So when j equals k plus 1, what is inside? Well, there's a k plus 1 here, there's a 0 here, so this is the binomial coefficient 1. Here there's a b sub k plus 1, and here we have n to the, to the 0, which is just 1. So this whole thing is just b sub k plus 1, this Bernoulli number, when j equals k plus 1. So if we strip that one off, then what's left is just the sum from j equals 0 to k of, this is a binomial coefficient, k plus 1 choose j, times the Bernoulli number b sub j, times this power n to the k plus 1 minus j. And sure enough, we see that we get what we want. That's the Bernoulli number that's involved. And this thing here is almost s sub k of n. It's almost this thing here, except that there's no 1 over k plus 1 out front, so we have to multiply this by k plus 1 to make, uh, to make this equal. So that's the proof of our, of our uh, 
derivative formula for the Van Weyber polynomials. So although our main formula is in terms of a derivative, how to go from the k plus first file Haber polynomial to the kth one, it's actually more instructive and maybe more useful to know how to go the other way around. And for that, all we have to do is invert the differential operator, and we do that by applying the integral operator. Okay, so almost as a direct consequence of that formula, we now get an inductive procedure for systematically, step by step, creating new file Haber polynomials, in other words, higher ones, from previous ones, and at the same time, churning out Bernoulli numbers at the same way. Okay, and so there's two formulas here, and these are really just applications of that previous one, where we apply the integral operator and make some small observations. So the inductive formula for Fallhaber polynomials tells us that the k plus first Fallhaber polynomial is the k plus first Bernoulli number times n, and I remind you this is half the time zero, right? When that index there is odd, this is zero, plus k plus one times the integral of the k file Haber polynomial. So we can get at the k plus first file Haber polynomial if we can integrate the kth one, which is elementary because integration is easy. We have to multiply by this factor and then we have to add a, a term involving this Bernoulli number. So how do we get at that? Well, that's given by the second formula, the inductive formula for Bernoulli numbers, which is that b sub k plus one is 1 minus k plus 1 s times s of k of 1. So again, it relies on integrating the kth Fallhaber polynomial, but now just evaluating that integral at 1. So we're replacing n with 1. Multiplying by k plus 1 and taking 1 minus that, and that's going to be b sub k plus 1. So if you wanted to, you could put these two together to get a formula that only involves going from s sub k to s sub k plus 1, and it's s sub k plus 1 of n equals n plus k plus 1 s times s sub k, in other words, the integral of s sub k at n, minus n times this uh, integral evaluated at 1. All right, so in the course, the Algebraic Calculus 1 course, um, we are going to illustrate very thoroughly the use of this so you can see actually that it actually works and I get some practice at going step by step and just generating file Haber polynomials step by step in a very simple way and if you have a computer well you just run it and uh, it's very simple it doesn't involve any linear algebra uh, side steps having to have a table of Bernoulli numbers we're generating them along the way if we want them but uh, we can just avoid them altogether by using this so it's a powerful technology, and it also, it's fun because we're introducing, for the first time, the algebraic derivative and the algebraic integral. So, there's much to learn. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.